Hello, Garland Nixon here with the great Jody Brar, and we're going to talk about all things imperialism. Let's talk. So I am holding a book here by a gentleman by the name, a brilliant gentleman named by the name of Harpo Brar. You might notice the name, uh, everyone out there watching, the father of Jody Brar, and it's called Imperialism: Decadent, Parasitic, Moribund Capitalism. So let's start with this, Jody. Oh, by the way, Jody Brar is the leader of the Communist Party of Great Britain, Marxism, Marxist Leninist. Is that is that how how do you how do you that how am I supposed to pronounce that? <laughs> The Communist Party of Great Britain, Marxist-Leninist. Online, uh, you can see on our thing here, online we're just called the Communists, which makes us quite easy to find. Uh, but yeah, CPGBML for short. Okay. All right. So let's start. Let's start with this because I know you're doing a lot of work on imperialism now, and there couldn't be a better time. You know, I, I recall um, when the um, special military operation started in Ukraine, and I read an article, Putin's imperial war and i thought oh my gosh the you, you know we've got 900 bases in the world but it's vladimir putin that's the imperialism there used to be a um a show in the, U, in the u.s a uh, a kid show called uh uh peewee's playhouse and whenever somebody would make an insult to him he would say i know what you are but what am i i know what you are but what am i and as soon as i heard that i thought yeah okay that's what that is so let's start with a definition of imperialism for those who may not have be uh, have a history of a of a revolutionary nature and they hear this word imperialism what are all the revolutionaries talking about imperialism the communist.org imperialism um what how for the for someone who has no clue about the word, about the history of it, what it means, break it down for us. Great question, Garland, put me on the spot. So really, uh, the very shortest definition you can make of imperialism is it's monopoly capitalism. And I think that's really important for people to understand because it's presented to us in a kind of colloquial way as if imperialism is just the foreign policy of certain countries and it's a kind of a, a choice that states make or don't make. Uh, but the truth is, imperialism is the development of the capitalist system to its monopoly phase where uh, concentration of wealth has become so uh, intense that uh, an economy that used to be characterized by lots of companies competing in a free trade way with each other becomes a a an economy that's dominated by monopolies. And at a certain point in time in the historical development of capitalism, that system became a global system because Capitalism, uh, in order to survive, has to constantly expand, expand its markets uh, because the, the, the markets, the, the ability to make money from a contained market becomes limited. So they have to expand. And what happened at the turn of the 20th century was that the whole of the world had become fully divided amongst the big monopoly capitalist powers. And we came into a new phase of capitalism in history, a new historical phase, and that was the phase, the final phase of development of capitalism, imperialism. When the whole world been divided up, the whole world is under, you know, a capitalist economy dominated by, you know, a few uh, monopoly capitalist powers. Uh, those those powers, their home economies, have become totally dominated in all spheres by monopoly. So, and we know that that's true, right? If, if you read Lenin's book on imperialism today, which was written in 1916, during World War I, World War I, uh, a war which was uh, fought between imperialist, rival imperialist powers to decide who would get what share of the loot of the globe, yes? It wasn't, it was fought in, in, in battlefields in Flanders, right? But it was not about Belgium. <laughs> it wasn't about France. It was about, the colonial loot and who gets who has the right to loot how much of the world and of course Britain having been the first monopoly capitalist power the first uh, country to have a big industrial revolution and a bourgeois revolution was of course the first one to grab uh, you know uh, colonial 
spheres that it could really dominate. And it, and it had the biggest uh, colonial uh, empire at the, at the beginning of World War I. And um, up and coming imperialist powers were not happy about that. They wanted, they wanted to take a share, but the only way they could get a share was at the expense of Britain and France, the older colonial, uh, stronger colonial powers. So essentially, imperialism is capitalism gone global and it's capitalism in its, in its monopoly phase. Um, and it's also capitalism in which all the contradictions of capitalism have become really, really intense uh, and uh, amplified um, in their extremity. You know, the, the extreme gap between rich and poor, the extreme contradiction between rich countries and poor countries, you know, they have become, and they become more and more extreme as time goes by. And of course, they're on a global level, not just a local level. You're muted, lovey. I'm muted. Okay, let me ask you this. There seems to be a, um, this particular phase of capitalism, I think maybe technology is part of the, um, part of the reason for this. There seems to be a very significant crack, internal crackdown. You know, I read every day that the British government, the UK government is passing another law where people can't protest to push back against the government. We have, um, you know, as it, as, it, as it has been described here in the United States, the government can look at your browser history, but you can't look at Joe Biden's browser history. You know, the crackdown against protests, the crack, crackdown against uprising, potential revolution seems to be at, uh, really heightening. What are your thoughts on that? Well, you've pinpointed something very important. And of course, it's really a result of the fact that um, the capitalist system, and of course the imperial system is the capitalist system kind of on steroids, cannot provide for all the people, right? And the more time that goes by, the less people it's able to provide for, in fact. Um, we've talked about this other times we've met, but, you know, essentially um, capitalism is a system where wealth concentrates. And the more time goes by where the world lives under capitalist production, the more, the, the more of humanity's wealth is concentrated in bigger and bigger piles in, held in fewer and fewer hands. And that creates problems for the capitalists themselves, you know, because their position at the top of this pile becomes more and more precarious. The number of people who are unemployed and who are and whose life is going downwards increases all the time. So they're creating a system in which um, it's inevitable that there will be uh, outbreaks of anger. Uh, and there's another reason that um, this anger comes about or these, these, this kind of unsettlement comes around, which is because um, there's something called a crisis of overproduction, which is built into capitalist production. And now that capitalism is global, it's a global phenomenon. And we're, we're deep into a crisis of overproduction right now. What that means is um, things are being produced uh, that can't be bought. Because fundamentally, the people who have to buy the goods are the working class, the masses of the world. But the masses are being made unemployed and impoverished through the workings of the same system that's producing all this wealth. They make the wealth, but they don't get paid enough to buy back the goods in which that wealth is embodied. So you have a fundamental problem, which is uh, this massive gap between what's being produced and what can be bought back by the people who are actually the producers, right? Uh, and because of that, we have what the Marxism identifies as overproduction. And it creates this contradiction in the system and a kind of explosion is built into capitalist production for profit right at the root. We are now in a, a global, a very, very deep global crisis of overproduction. And this creates huge economic problems that the imperialists are constantly trying to manage. One of the reasons, uh, one of the ways they try to manage it is driving to war to, to um, number one, it creates demand in the economy, first of all, for armaments, uh, and later on for reconstruction. Um, the other thing is that um, the imperialists hope to conquer markets that they can loot, make a profit from. Um, we've been living in a slightly odd time since World War I, because we have, we've no longer been in the classical imperialist era, of course, the thing that came out of the revolutionary situation of World War I was the October Revolution. 
So for 100 and more years, 105 now, 106, we've been living in the era of socialist revolutions, the era when imperialism will, over time, find itself being replaced by a socialist system. And of course, that's meant that the classical kind of world market, purely cap capitalist, purely dominated by capitalist powers, imperialist powers fighting each other for control, has uh, shifted somewhat. The, the traditional imperialist powers uh, of East Asia, that's Japan, and of Western Europe, France, Germany, Britain, Italy in particular, they have become massively weakened through the process of two world wars and what that did to them. The USA was really the only imperialist power that not only survived but thrived through those two world wars, essentially because it wasn't massively involved, it wasn't a battleground, it wasn't losing colonies through the process of those wars. Quite the reverse, it ended up taking over the primary colonial position of the fading colonial powers. But of course, October, as well as making liberated territories that weren't open to the imperialists to loot, which immediately gives their system a problem because instead of expanding, they're contracting, um, it also set in motion the era of national liberation. And this era, you know, we're still living in that time, right? The, the mentality of national liberation is now universal across the world. There is no people who thinks it's oh, it's our lot to be inferior, it's our lot to be looted, it's our lot to be dominated. You know, wherever neo-colonialism has taken hold in countries that fought liberation struggles and thought they were getting independence but ended up under the, the even stronger, almost, financial domination of imperialist countries after they thought they'd got rid of physical um, imperialist occupation. Um, those peoples have not simply sat, sat on their bums and gone, oh, well, this is my fate. You know, we see constant upsurges of revolutionary national liberation activity all over the world where neo-colonial imperialist financial domination is still in place. And of course, most recently, um, we saw that uh, big movement in West Africa uh, this year, which is, you know, it's, it, it, it makes the headlines in our media kind of suddenly, but of course, what you're seeing is part of a process that's been ongoing for decades um, and continues to be ongoing all over Asia, Africa, Latin America. It's exactly what we see in Palestine right now. You know, Palestine is the fulcrum of the struggle of the whole of the Middle East to be free of US imperialist domination. Um, so anyway, sorry, coming back to what you're asking about, you know, the reality is that the imperial system is, is increasingly destabilized right now. And what that means is, um, even in the Western countries, where we had this post-war, post-Second World War period of relatively decent standard of living, not only for a small section of the working class, which is kind of part of how imperialism operates, it, it bribes off a small strata of the privileged workers and gives them kind of privileges that make them feel that uh, allegiance to the system and to the ruling class, in the post-war period after World War II, because of the gains of socialism, because of the triumph of socialism all through the interwar period and in, and in beating fascism in the East and the West um, in World War II, there was a massive revolutionary upsurge as a result of that. It resulted in many national liberation victories. It resulted in the establishment of many socialist countries. And it resulted in uh, a massive kind of retreat uh, if you like, in the imperialist countries themselves, which was they made this welfare state settlement that lifted up the lives of all the working class, not just a small section as before, but the whole of the working class, which even in the imperialist countries in the before World War One and between the two world wars, the mass of the working class suffered terrible conditions, privation, poverty, you know, lack of decent services, you know, starvation even. Um, you know, little kids going without shoes on their feet and, and proper food to drink and all that type of thing that we now think of as historical. Oh, that's a thing from the past. But it's we can see now it's starting to come back because in the West, our rulers can no longer afford this bribe on the one hand. And on the other hand, the retreat of the socialist camp makes them feel like they don't have to pay it. The workers in the West have become disarmed in terms of their socialist consciousness and therefore easy prey to manipulation by the ruling class and to being made to feel that this system is all there is 
and you know inequality is natural and inevitable and there's not really anything you can do about it you're just an individual is the message of all of our culture and media for a reason right they don't want us to understand our collective strength they want us to feel like weak little individuals who can't really do anything uh, but even so in the conditions of deepening crisis an accelerating war drive, both of which are causing tremendous problems for the workers in the in the West as well as around the world, uh, our rulers no longer feel confident that they can convince us that this system has our best interests at heart. And so, of course, the only way they feel able to keep control is to clamp down on dissent in all its forms, whether that's free speech or protest. But what you see is that is really a sign of the system's weakness, that it feels it needs to do that. You know, it's very easy to look at, you know, how powerful the state seems to be and see, oh, my God, they can see everything I do. They can read my mind, you know, and they know everything I'm doing. And they're like, big brother, they're so strong. But actually, the need to crack down on us in this sort of micromanaging, what it feels like a very micromanaging way, is actually a sign of the weakness of the state. And I just, sorry, I've been going on a bit, but I just want to give a little analogy. No, we're fine. Go, go on as long as you need. Thank you, darling. If you look right now at the Aluxa flood operation in Gaza, now there is a policed bunch of people, right? In a, you could call it like a goldfish bowl. I mean, Gaza Strip is, you know, a few miles long by a few miles wide. It's surrounded by listening posts and observation and, you know, every single thing anybody does on an electronic device is recorded. You know, they've got uh, cameras. They've got, they've got footage of every square inch of Gaza that's retaken like sort of every couple of minutes. I mean, the amount of surveillance on that tiny little area is unbelievable. Right. And they've got all kinds of modern technology. And Israel goes around the world telling everybody how brilliant their spy technology is and, and what geniuses they are and how they can surveil the crap out of everybody and nobody can get away with anything on their watch. Right. And yet. And yet. When people apply themselves to getting around these systems, they can, because what's the one thing that shocked the world when Aluxa flood broke out? was the fact that Israel was caught napping. They hadn't expected it. They didn't know how to respond to it. They had no idea of the capabilities of the Palestinians that they watched so heavily. They didn't know that this operation was about to happen. So we have to remember that behind all of this technology, in the end, there has to be people. And we can't allow ourselves to be overwhelmed by the fear of you know, the kind of big brother police control, control, you know, in the end, our rulers go to these lengths to try to make us feel afraid to move because they know that if we really move, there's jack they can do about it. It's something I've wanted to, that we've discussed that I, I you know, I, I wanted to hear you um, elaborate on. And that is, there was a move, and uh, uh, amongst you know, uh, conser it was a, a more conservative audience. We've heard these types of discussions in um, uh, in the U.S. And it was the, the the Trump people, the MAGA, America First, etc. Make America great. Here's the word again. These people intuitively looked at a time period, let's say the 1950s or the 1960s, conveniently after World War II, after the rest, all of our potential industrial and economic adversaries were bombed, you know, to three feet high, where it looked like Gaza, unfortunately, right, after World War II. And so the U.S. could easily go out, pillage all of the natural resources they wanted, you know, the uh, the, uh, you know, bananas from South America, the coffee from Ethiopia, you name it, take all of these things. And the U.S. economy appeared to be flourishing. And from their perspective, from the angle that they saw it, wow, our system works really well. People get out of high school with no education. They get a job. They have a family. They have, you know, 3.25 children and two cars and all, all of that on a, a, a salary working in the factory, right? And it appeared to be working well for them. Certainly, they didn't have a grasp on the pillage of resources that was going on in the third world. What do you have to say about the perspective about that 
um, way of viewing the world to say, we want to get back to those times like in the 60s and 70s when you could get a job and the economy seemed to be and wages were going blah, blah, blah. And the, you know, you could eat three meals, you could eat cake and ice cream three times a day and never gain a pound. You know, that was the greatest times. What do you have to say to people who have that perspective? Yeah, good question, isn't it? You know, um, there are some very important historical peculiarities about the, the time period that you pinpointed, Garland. And that is, number one, what I touched on earlier, and you've touched on it as well, that social gains for the mass of the population, and not just a section of the population, were very much brought about by the threat of the example of the Soviet Union. Everywhere at the end of World War II, communism had huge prestige. The communists won the war everywhere. And the truth is that apart from the USA, imperialism was on its knees after World War II, totally. In, in, you know, in all parts of the world, uh, the imperialist powers were, were broken. And, and, you know, to be honest with you, Japanese and the European imperialist powers would not have recovered if it weren't for the help of the USA. It's doubtful even whether Britain would have managed to limp along for much longer. Um, so there's that to understand that it's a particular historical period and that for a lot of ordinary people, the uplift in their circumstances was directly the result of the gains of socialism and the threat, the competition that that gave to the imperialists, like we better make it look like our working class doesn't need to have revolution to get a good life because otherwise they're just going to get rid of us, right? And on the other hand, you, you alluded to it, what you were saying just now. Those gains in the imperialist countries were paid for by a doubling down and intensification of the looting of the colonies. So built into that, you've never had it so good period, is a bribe that says, put on your blinkers, and don't look at the rest of the world. Don't ask yourself how we're paying for this, right? And there was a kind of there was a, a kind of horrible social deal that was done, a, a, a deal with the devil, actually, because the the bribe wasn't just make social peace and give up your ideas of socialism. It was let us carry on looting the world. You'll get something out of it. And we got the National Health Service, we got council housing, we got free education here in Britain, you know, and it's the same in America, you know. So you you have this whole um, flourishing, what seems like, oh, we've never had it so good and everybody's middle class now and we've all got our, we've all got houses and education and we're having a nice life and don't look at where it comes from. It's just because, and they built into the system, this ideology that they teach us from ever so young, it's just because we're better. There's something inherently superior about the civilization of the West that we can just give ourselves a nice life and we know how to do things well and other people don't. And the fact that we're living off the wealth of the rest of the world, let's not talk about that. Let's not even notice it. Um, this thing of the MAGA, make America great again, or we have a phenomenon over here, the Little Englanders, Right. Who are the people who basically want to get back to the days when Britain ruled the waves, you know, ruled Britannia. Remember those days when uh, we could go it alone? We were a, we didn't need to lean on America. We didn't le need to lean on Europe. We didn't need to lean on anybody. Uh, we were a big power and we've never forgotten it <laughs> and we still can't quite get over it. You know, we still look down on the Americans as the kind of newly arrived, you know, oh, who are these people? You know, they need us to advise them because... Good gracious, listen to how they talk, you know. Um, this idea that there's a there's a perfect period to get back to. Number one, and we talked about this a bit when we met Garland, you know, whenever people are looking back to the past and seeing seeing there the solutions to the problems of the future or the present, they have this tendency to create a, a, a version of the past in which all the problems don't exist. <laughs> So the, the version, the idealized picture of the past they present actually never existed. You know, you were talking about the USA in the 60s and 70s, right? Well, if I'm not much mistaken, the civil rights movement kicked off in the USA in the 1960s. Why? Because for, you know, the black population, in, in, especially in the Bible Belt Southern states, you know, it was like slavery had never ended. <laughs> slavery ended 
formally, legalistically, but in reality, that was an apartheid land and the former slaves were kept very much in their place in a you know, thousand and one different ways, you know. So the idea that imperialism had a, a, had a period where it was really nice to the working class is in itself an illusion. And the other thing to always understand about you know, these ideas that if we could just somehow get back to X, Y, and Z, I mean, you have lots of people today who wish we could get all the way back to a halcyon kind of nice feudal period where we, because we'd all live off the land and wouldn't that be good, you know, and they sort of forget what serfdom's really like. Um, but the truth is, okay, even if you can do that, even if you can wind back the clock and get back to this place, where do you think that's going to lead you? It's going to lead you right back to here. From there is how we got to here. So you have to understand that the problems of today were built into the model of development of that time. That problem is the problems, they're the problems of capitalism. And we're not gonna solve them by just going back a couple of cyclical periods of, you know, you know, before this latest kind of plunge into really horrible crisis and when things looked all right, because they were leading inexorably to here. You know, the Vietnam War, was happening in the 1960s. And you can see the seeds of so much of the US's decline in that war. Why was it fighting that war in the first place? Why did the USA spend so much of its effort after World War II massacring communists everywhere they, where they were popping up around the world? Why? Because they know that the future is a socialist future. And the only way to stave it off is to, to like drench the world in blood. And that is what they have been doing. And that is what they will continue to do. You know, one of the things that you mentioned is uh, <clears throat> the importance of what's happening in Gaza right now. The, um, <clears throat> what that represents, why, if you look at what the US is doing, um, it doesn't make sense from a, a number of perspectives, but I know it has to make sense and you're gonna make sense uh, for, uh, uh, for us. But, you look at it and I see the uh, the U.S. government um, not supporting. They're not supporting Israel. To me, here's what I say. There's there's no Israel. The, they're, they are, they're flying U.S. Uh, planes. They're dropping U.S. bombs. They're U.S. military people on the ground directing this. They're, they have vir virtually no economy right now. The United States is fully um, uh, economically supporting Israel. This is a United States move. And the people in the U.S. overwhelmingly are aghast at what's going on there. Um, why is it so important for the um the people, the you know, controllers of this uh, global financialized capital. Why is it so important, so critical for them to um, to take this action in the Gaza, even though it's so damaging to them in so many ways? It seems to me that they have a priority. You know, they do a. I'll put it like this: they always do a cost benefit analysis, and they're saying the world's going to hate hate us. Our own people are going to hate us. The party that's in power is going to get wiped out, which doesn't really matter. There's so many things, reasons why you could look at it and say, why would they do this? But I know you're going to clarify why. What's so important that they're taking the chances that they're doing, and they're going so over the top to do this? You know, what we have to understand about what goes on in Palestine is. And it can almost sound dismissive to say this because it's like, you know, you are putting aside the sufferings of generations upon generations and millions and millions of Palestinians. It's not actually about Palestine. It's about the Middle East, domination of the Middle East, in particular, the oil of the Middle East. Now, if you look back to when the Zionist uh, colonization, the settler colonial project in Israel was first tentatively green lighted was back in 1917. And you have to understand that back at that time, oil had just become number one commodity on the planet. Why? Because not only was it beginning to drive industry, you know, previously it had all been coal fired, it was beginning to drive industry. In 1912, I think it was, I could get that wrong, the Royal Navy, Britain's Royal Navy, remember Britain rules the waves, switched to oil power. So oil became the number one commodity of the world and it has remained so. 
it has remained so. It still is the number one most important commodity to control. And something you have to understand about imperialism is it not only needs resources for itself to control to, to feed its war machines and its industrial machines, it also needs to monopolize resources to deprive its rivals of them. One of the ways the imperialist work is to hold on to things and stop other people getting access to them or make it difficult for them to access to them. So monopolizing control of very key important raw materials is the key to the continued existence of monopoly powers. Um, so when you look at the Middle East, when you look at Palestine and Israel, you have to understand it in this context of the, the battle to keep control of the Middle Eastern resources, especially the oil, and in, in order to keep control, various, um, you know, a whole geopolitical game has been played. But the origins of the Palestinian conflict come from this decision that the best way to keep control of the Middle Eastern resources was to have a settler colony in the middle of the region. And Zionism was to hand. Zionism had been going around all the imperialist powers asking, Theodore Herzl was the leader of Zionism at the end of the 19th century, and he knocked on the door of everybody. There were discussions with the Germans about a colony in Africa. There were discussions with the British about Uganda. They were, they were offering anybody anything. I can't remember what they talked to the French about, but I'm sure they had a discussion with the French as well. And eventually it was decided, the British decided, and, the, and Lord Balfour, Prime Minister, and I think he was the Prime Minister at the time anyway, uh, signed a piece of paper at the same time that the British government on it, as a as a um, in, in the deal of getting the Arabs to fight on the British side against the Ottoman Empire in World War One had promised the Arabs liberation after World War One, which they didn't get. He simultaneously wrote, signed a piece of paper uh, to the Zionists saying, uh, "We think it's a good idea to set up a settler colony." Home for the a homeland for the Jewish people in Palestine. Uh, and that is how you have to understand Israel. Israel is not about protecting Jews. It didn't happen as a response to the Holocaust because the plan started decades earlier, long before the um, Holocaust of Jews happened uh, at Hitler's hands or the, the Nazis' hands in World War II. Um, it was accelerated through that process. And, uh, you know, my father's written a very good little pamphlet on Zionism, which everybody should read. It's available for free on the Internet as well as to buy quick before they ban it, um, you know, which goes into the, the history and development of all of that. But if you want to understand what's going on in Palestine, you have to understand, number one, it's, it's the Middle East. It's not just about Israel, Palestine. It's not about Jewish people. It's not that as a particular thing about Palestinian people. The Palestinian people had the misfortune to be in the place where the British decided to set up their settler colony. Um, the deal that was made was really another one of these, what we talk about a pact with the devil, right? In return for getting sort of huge amount of uh, backing for their development, um, uh, subsidies and lots and lots of armaments, the Jewish people who colonized Palestine and set up the state of Israel, um, agreed that they would be imperialism's outpost. And they, that's exactly what they are. They are an armed base with kind of um, plausible deniability, if you like, for the imperialists. After the Suez crisis, when British imperialism was in decline all around the world, but especially in the Middle East, the USA took over patronage, main patronage of Israel, but it essentially it, sold, it, it serves the oil monopolies. And the, and the main governments of the oil monopolies are the American government and the British government, American by which I mean USA, of course. Uh, so there's the US government and the British government are the main representatives of, the, of big oil. <laughs> we are the basis for the biggest oil companies in the world, and they are some of the most important uh, monopolies in the world, full stop. Right? And they're, what they want um, very much dictates the policies of the British and American US governments. So did I answer your question? Was there something else? Was oh, uh, uh, wonderfully. But I, now, here's something I want to ask you about. And, and I think this is important, a very, very important discussion, a discussion that is not had um, North Korea. 
Mm-hmm. Let's talk about North Korea a little bit. And I tell you why, because it has been, you know, indoctrinated into American society that North Korea is run by, and, and you love this, right? Crazy people mad, insane people, right? A paranoid hermit kingdom, et cetera. And uh, there's an old saying, you've probably heard it, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean people aren't really out to get you, right? Um, there is no examination of the historical attacks on uh, North Korea um, from the imperialist, the imperialist powers, vicious, brutal, you know, uh, 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 um, attacks, genocidal attacks on North Korea. And it is also uh, portrayed in the same way that Venezuela is portrayed. Well, they're having issues of poverty and uh, economic problem because of mismanagement, ignoring the uh, egregious sanctions against North Korea. Um, but those of us who know the history of North Korea understand differently. But most people don't. I mean, I've talked to people who I would think would have some idea and they'd be like, well, you know, North Korea is very, very dangerous and we just can't. There's such a threat and blah, blah, blah. Talk to me about North Korea, how we should view North Korea from your perspective, how you view North Korea, Korea and why. I love North Korea. <laughs> For me, North Korea is a bastion of freedom and liberty. And it's a signpost to the future, Garland, actually. You know, North Korea, a tiny country. And let's not forget when, when, when the country was forcibly partitioned, something which all Koreans wish to see resolved, uh, forcibly partitioned by the USA after World War II, um, the part that st- managed to stay liberated um, is a smaller part. It's a mountainous part. It, most of the agricultural land and raw materials are in the south. So it was already off to a bad start. Then it had, a, as you say, a truly genocidal war forced upon it. You know, during what they call the Korean War and what the Korean people call uh, the Fatherland Liberation War, three years of fighting not only against the USA, but against, I think, 14 countries went in under a UN flag that was basically the US imperialist flag, uh, invaded and and, um, fought against uh, the DPRK and the Korean people generally. Five million Korean people died in those three years. We talk endlessly about the Holocaust of the Jews. And of course, the Holocaust of the Jews in World War II was horrific. But you know, the imperialists want to present that like that's the only Holocaust that ever happened. And when you look at the history of the last 200 years, what you see is the colonial, well, 400 years, actually, the colonial period and modern imperialism are a string and an unbroken string, actually, of Holocaust. It's endless. And after World War II, the populations that got the worst bloodbaths inflicted upon them were ones where socialism communism was rearing its head, was making a break for liberty and freedom for the people. And they got drowned in blood. Now, the people of North Korea emerged from that war, actually, the victors. They fought the USA into uh, a standstill. The USA that had been absolutely determined that they were bombing it back to the Stone Age, they said, there's not a building worth left standing that's worth the name. There's not a village, there's not a town. They won't be back on their feet for a thousand years. But look at Pyongyang now, look all over North Korea now. The development, they have not stood still in the last 75 years. They have, despite, as you said, another genocidal, you know, decades worth of of, uh, economic strangulation aimed at making them isolated and forcing them to rely purely on themselves, which is a very hard thing to do in a war-torn country with a small population and and a low level of of resources to start with, to build up your economy, to to develop a modern economy in those conditions is exceptionally difficult. Um, Luckily for the DPRK, they were not completely isolated. They managed to maintain decent relations both with the Soviet Union and with the People's Republic of China, which was a difficult thing to do in that historical period, because of course, those countries had a had a split that became very um, active and anim- animos, <laughs> full of animosity. I can't think of the word I'm looking for. Um, and it was difficult for a country to remain friends with, with both 
of those powers. And actually the leadership of Kim Il-sung, um, who was the founding leader of um, the DPRK and the leader of the Workers' Party of Korea, which is their kind of communist party, um, he was very deft in leading his country through that very, very difficult period. That's the reason he and his descendants are so loved and revered and trusted by the people of North Korea. Now, you know, you talked about how uh, the media in the West have this propaganda uh, narrative and the onslaught of, of propaganda to tell us that the leaders of North Korea are crazy, paranoid and isolated. Well, crazy is what they say about everybody who stands up to them. Find me a leader who has stood up to the imperialists, who hasn't been presented as a crazy, you can't do it. I mean, in the run up to the launch of the special military, military operation in Ukraine um, by Russia nearly two years ago now, February 2022, um, I, looked, uh, I looked at the, the American Journal of Psycho Psychology, Psychology Today, and in February and March 2022, that journal, which is supposed to be a serious scientific journal, carried 10 articles, 10 articles about the mental state of Vladimir Putin, the president of Russia. And of course, none of them was flattering. None of them was by a person who'd ever met Vladimir Putin or had him on a couch to you know, have a serious discussion about his mental health and his hangups, right? It's all propaganda. And, astonishing to me and tells you something about the level of science in a, in a decadent and dying bourgeois society that it's so easily bought off as propaganda. No matter what the field, you'll find an eminent scientist who will twist his science to please the imperialist paymasters, right? So anyway, my point is, if you stand up to imperialism, you're a crazy. By definition, they're going to do a they're going to do a job on you. Look at what horrific uh, stories they came out with about uh, Colonel Gaddafi, the leader of the Libyan Revolution at the time, uh, where they were building up to war against Libya. You know, they would show him in pictures of African dress, which was his fantastic way of showing that he believed in the dignity of Africans. And he, he believed that the future for Africa was a one where African countries would all work together and respect one another. And remember that there had historically been lots of racism against black Africans in the in North African Arab parts of Africa, right? So it was a very important statement he was making, just like when he had uh, female elite armed bodyguards, uh, he was making a statement to the Islamic world about women. These were important statements he was making, but of course it was twisted in our media to say, look at this crazy, paranoid, lunatic guy, look at his funny outfits. I mean, really racist crap, right? Look at his funny outfits. Oh, and then they, you know, they they put their kind of pornographic twist on everything. Oh, you know, look at he's he surround himself with women, you know, all this type of thing. They do all of this propaganda to say these people are crazy. Of course, they have to do that, right? But paranoid and isolated. Well, let's decode that. Isolated. Okay, this is the uh, what do you call it? projection, right? The imperialists see and describe what they wish to be true. They're doing everything in their power to isolate North Korea. The truth is they've never quite succeeded because even after the fall of the Soviet Union, which ushered in a really difficult period for the remaining socialist countries, all of which, apart from China, were small, right? Um, Vietnam. Uh, Cuba, Laos, North Korea, small countries, very difficult for them to survive in this period where the, uh, the this big socialist trading bloc had gone, and um, which let's re let's remember wasn't just the USSR but lots of people's republics of Eastern Europe, so it had a massive impact on their ability to trade and develop uh, their economies. Uh, a really really tough tough period, but. North Korea and China, although their relationship hasn't always been as smooth as one might like, it remained and they've kept a basically a very porous border, actually. So the idea that, you know, you know, North Koreans are kind of kept in this prison and they can't escape and it's terrible there. Well, it's nonsense. You know, actually, 
uh, North Koreans can go to China and come back again uh, without that much difficulty. They stay in their country because they love their country. And actually they're building a socialist country and they have things you can't get elsewhere. I remember years ago talking to um, a lady from North Korea who had traveled to many countries um, working with friendship societies. And um, because she traveled many places, which a lot of North Koreans haven't, they don't get the chance, uh, not because their government won't let them, but because, you know, the world doesn't let you kind of free, freely travel backwards and forwards very easily. Um, I said to her, oh, you've seen a lot of the world. What was your favorite place? And she said to me, without a beat, North Korea. And I said, oh, oh, so why is that? She said, you know, my country is so peaceful. It's so peaceful there, she said to me. That's how she described it, her home. And I thought about it and I thought about the descriptions I'd heard of it. And one of the things I thought about was, you know, there's no adverts. You don't walk through your life being screamed at by, you know, posters of billboards and, and TV screens and packaging. Imagine going to a supermarket that where every shelf is not made up of packets that are just kind of screaming at you, buy me, buy me, buy me, buy me, where, where things have been produced just, you know, that don't have any useful value. But they, but they, mar they have marketing, you know, and they want to pers persuade you to buy them. And so their packaging kind of shouts at you. It's a very stressful experience. And then, you know, the, the, there's, there's, you know, when you go down the supermarket aisles, not only every packet has got packaging that's aimed at getting your attention, but then there's adverts hanging in the aisles, aren't there? But oh, do, 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 do this, do that, do this, do that. And then there might be screens in the, you know, in the petrol station, there might be a screen like where some guy's actually talking to you. And, you know, you can't get away from all of this, the noise that this creates in your brain. Um, they don't have that in North Korea. Yeah. They produce things that people need. They buy them, you know, and, and that's that. Nobody's trying to make you buy something, right? So it's a completely different relationship that you have with, you know, stuff. Um, but on top of that, they have things like um, children's palaces, uh, I remember years and years ago meeting someone from North Korea and he said, uh, oh, we have a slogan in our country. In our country, the children are kings. And they have created what they call children's palaces, which basically means a really nice building where kids go after school to do all kinds of after school activities. So number one, they're looked after after the school day. Number two, they get to do loads of stuff, anything they're interested in, build a radio, make a model boat, paint, draw, learn an instrument, whatever it is, for free, with good tutors in a nice space. And they make a point of making these buildings nice. They call them children's palaces. Yes, yeah? so they have this idea about making architecture, which is for the common people, something that's beautiful. You know, they're very proud of the library in central Pyongyang and what a kind of beautiful building that is. They make a point of this, you know, make a, a metro station where people have to go through it every day to and from work, make it beautiful, make it a work of art. Let the people who come through it feel that society cares about them, right? That's the aim of this public architecture as a, as a, as a beautiful space. And it's something that started, of course, with the Soviet Union. And anyone who's seen the, the beautiful metro stations in Moscow and Leningrad will know what I'm talking about um, in terms of what the, what the Soviets did for public, public spaces. But right down to Garland, right now, if you go and search them out, you can find on the internet photos of the high development that's taking place in, in application of science to agriculture in North Korea. You know, they're building like little robots and things to help mechanize things, you know, and stop the kind of backbreaking aspect of labor, even though they don't have the best agricultural land, even though, you know, um, they can't have huge fields that they're kind of, uh, classic um, large-scale farming. They're working out ways to apply um, technology even in, in smaller fields um, to, to raise the level of production and to cut out aspects of the work which are really backbreaking for ordinary people. Um, they're constantly building new houses and when they've built them, they give them to the workers for free. Let me say that again. They give them their houses for free. Housing does not cost you anything in the DPRK. This is something, can you imagine living in a world with that level of security? You definitely have three meals a day. You definitely have a home. Your children definitely have education to whatever level they need it to. 
you definitely have health care. You don't have bills. Nobody in the DPRK is threatened with bills or eviction. That's 99% of everything that most ordinary people in the rest of the world worry about, gone. Okay, so the idea that Korea, North Korea is something crazy and insane, um, the reason that the propaganda level is so high is because North Korea, despite its tiny size, is actually an, an exam, and despite the fact it's had to spend a disproportionate amount of its budget on self defense so that it can survive and keep the peace that its people have enjoyed for 75 years. They've had that peace because of their weapons program, right? In order to keep the peace, the, the North Korean government has had to spend a huge amount on weapons development, but they've done it. And in so doing, they've ensured their peace and they've applied the principles of a planned economy to develop the lives of the people despite all the difficulties. They would have been far ahead of where they are now if it wasn't for the actions of the West, that is for sure. But the fact that they can do all that despite everything that's been done to them, shows you the power of a planned economy. When you're not producing for profit, when you don't have to keep an elite section of society super rich, when you're not exploiting the workers, but collectively using the wealth you produce to benefit everybody, you know, amazing things can be done even in the most difficult of circumstances. And that's the example that our rulers don't want us to engage with. And why they make it so hysterically kind of high level of propaganda so that it's to stop us from trying to find anything out. Because the second you engage with just some basic facts about North Korea, all of that's blown away and you're like, well, why can't we have that then? Um, something else I wanted to ask you about, we got a little bit of time left. Oh, we've got some time left. Um, and that is the concept of a private sector imperialism. Here's what I mean. You know, and, and we've discussed this, wherein traditionally we think about imperialism from the perspective of the, you know, the Spanish Armada. Oh, they're ruling the seas. The British are ruling the seas. The U.S., I heard Hillary talking about one of the problems we have with China is they want a, quote, blue water navy. In other words, we are all about controlling the shipping lanes and the lanes of commerce throughout the world. And we're afraid that someone... Not that China would want to control the lanes of commerce, but they'd be able to thwart us from controlling the lanes of commerce and blocking them in at, at whenever our you know whim set us in that direction. Okay. But there are new variant forces arising wherein you get a company, Apple, whatever. And this company is, let's say, an American company. And it becomes um, wealthy to the point where it has more money than most of the nations on the earth, right? But rather than remain, this is an American company, they say, we're going to build our things where there's cheap labor in country X, where we can take advantage of the workers here. We're going to have all our profits claimed in the Isle of you know, money laundering, as we, you know what I mean? We'll just call it the Isle of Money Laundering. We know how that works. You know, the British Empire, still, the U.S. still has little colonies. So the empire still have little islands here and there where they can hide money and there's no taxes, right? Do, are these private sector imperial powers, because to some extent they have no stake in a home country, in maintaining um, stability in a home country. Who cares? Now, to, 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 to Apple, what's the difference between the United States and the, and, the, and the country where they're exploiting the labor and building their, um, uh, you know, developing country, as they call it, where they're building their products, et cetera. So your thoughts on this concept of, of, a, of a private sector, globalist, people like to use that word, imperialist power that is not founded in a particular country. Your thoughts? Yeah, you know, ever since the, the days of capitalism going global, people have been making this point, Garland. They've been saying, well, look, you can sort of see the tendency, right, to towards glo very globalised corporations uh, that sort of don't really differentiate where, they, where they're investing or where they're keeping their money or all of that type of thing and where they have a foothold in many places. So you, they see they seem, uh, lots of people talk about transnational corporations to, to identify what they see as a corporation that doesn't have a kind of an allegiance to a country. 
And, and of course, they think of an allegiance to a country as being something kind of patriotic, like they care about what happens to the people of that country. Now, uh, I think we have to separate those two concepts, really. Um, I think the reason why we never have ended up in the place where people have constantly predicted we will and then we never get there, it always breaks apart. Why? Because of competition. Now, competition is something which is built into the bones of the capitalist system and even more into the imperialist system. And what it means is even as um, corporations can make alliances and uh, and transact business all over the world. I mean, let me tell you, before World War I, there was a whole uh, kind of section of public opinion in the West that said a war in Europe is never going to happen because Britain's got too much invested in Germany. Germany's got too much invested in Britain. Like, it doesn't make business sense, right? But the thing is, ultimately, competition is built into this system. And in the final analysis, Competition results in violent outbreaks. To settle the differences in the end, it always comes down to war. To wage a war, you need to have command of the armies of a nation state. That's basically why multi these corporations, in the end, have a government and a nation state and an armed section of armed forces, which, which they pull back on when it comes to needing to settle their differences by force that's what they fall back on. And um, I think that's, you know, this, the, the, the tendency of competition to break out before kind of ultra huge alliances can be formed. You know, the ruling class can't become a, a kind of global elite that just agrees with itself about how to loot the world. This was a theory, the theory of ultra imperialism was actually put forward by a guy called Kautsky. Uh, leading up to and well, I think during World War One, and he was absolutely eviscerated by Lenin. He wrote a whole book about him uh, called The Proletarian Revolution and the Renegade Kautsky. And it's really sad for Kautsky that now how he's remembered is the renegade, right? The, the betrayer of socialism. At the time when he was writing, he was considered to be the leader of world socialism. He was the leader of the German Socialist Party, which was the biggest most historically longest lived, biggest socialist, communist, they called it social democratic those days, but it, they meant communist party in the world. And he was the leader or the theoretical leader of it and had this huge reputation around the world as the man, right? And Lenin spent years saying, this guy's betraying us, this guy's uh, let go of his Marxism. And everyone was like, who's this Lenin guy? <laughs> but of course now, you know, Lenin was proved to be right. And Kautsky has, earned this place in the history books as, you know, this awful revisionist renegade. He put forward this theory of ultra imperialism, that imperialism will ultimately is tending towards a peaceful uh, unity of the global exploiters who will between them just agree on uh, how to rule the world. And therefore there's a way to get to, although it's full of uh, inequality and exploitation, peace, you can have peace in this kind of projected idea of ultra imperialism. And that's sort of the idea, I think, that, that, that comes along with this idea of, uh, of transnational capital, that in the end, you're saying that the imperialist, you know, the financial oligarchs will form one single class, all get along together and just peacefully share out the looting of the globe. They can't peacefully share out the looting of the globe. It's not possible. History has shown that time and time again. You know, you only have to look at within a monopoly system, you know, in any area of the economy, there'll be a few massive monopolies that run that sphere of the economy, whether it's making steel or making mobile phones or whatever it might be. Yes, we, we all know oil. Um, and since World War One, or well, since World War Two, um, officially all the imperialist governments have policies against cartels and monopolization. But the truth, we know that it continues just as it did before World War I. Before World War I, when these companies would get together to form a cartel, they'd have a contract drawn up. And the terms of the contract were public. And you could go and have a look at what were, how they divided up the market between themselves and what they'd agreed about production quotas and how, what they'd agreed about price fixing. Now, officially, we don't do that stuff anymore, right? But 
in reality, we all know it's still going on. That price fixing is one of the ways that the monopoly corporations keep their profits higher than they otherwise would be is by agreeing on market shares with each other and agreeing on price fixing with each other, right? But what happens to these cartels? Inside the cartel, there's still competition. There's still the desire of each, of each member of the cartel to out-compete the other members. And eventually, you know, none of these cartel agreements actually last very long. They break down. They break down and they come into open competition again. And then, you know, some years down the line, maybe they'll get together, do another cartel. But the point is that competition means that the peaceful looting of the globe between a, a bunch of super exploiters never comes about because it always breaks into open competition. The, the, the desperate quest for bigger and bigger a share uh, for a bigger share than someone else you know, for, to, to expand your share of markets, of resources to monopolize and loot um, is just too strong. And in the end, it breaks down all these alliances. And that's why I think you have to uh, recognize that ultimately we're not going to get to a phase where the capitalists don't have a kind of national base uh, that, they, that they root themselves in because they need that state and that army behind them when they go to war. And um, I think what we have to separate that from the kind of, they don't seem to care about the people in their country. They never did. We had an illusion they did because of the peace settlement we got after World War II. Uh, for America, it was before World War II, but you, you know, with, um, I'm forgetting his name, who everybody loves in America because of building dams and things. Help me out. FDR. FDR, thank yes. you. Yes. Because of FDR, right? So you got it with FDR, we got it, Clement Attlee, you know, um, France got it with uh, De Gaulle, maybe. I'm, I'm not brilliant. But, you know, you get the idea. So the, the post-war peace settlement was a particular moment. But, of course, it created all these illusions in the minds of people that the ruling class and the working class have common interests, that we have a shared civilization, that our rulers somehow care about us, have civilized values, think about us as human beings. What we're learning is the mentality that our ruling class famously had about the workers in our countries in World War I, where they considered us subhumans, complained about how useless we were and threw us in hundreds of thousands into battles, you know, to, to die in humongous industrial quantities in the trenches of World War I. That same mentality has never stopped. The supremacist mentality is the mentality of the rulers of this system. And it, it can't really be otherwise, can it? How do you justify your place at the top of an ever sharper, you know, triangle, right? Where the, or, or, or no, well, like that, you know, the huge masses getting bigger and bigger and right at the bottom and the tiny number of people at the top enjoying all the wealth and all the power. How do you justify your place at the top of that if it's not with a supremacist outlook that says, well, they're not really people like us, so it doesn't matter that we throw hundreds of millions of them, you know, into charnel houses on a yearly basis to keep our system going. Wow, that was awesome. Well, Jody, thank you very much. Certainly appreciate it. We've taken an hour of your time and all of us have learned a lot. Um, and and uh, I look forward to uh, many more. Hopefully we can get you on here, you know, weekly, bi-weekly, whatever your schedule will allow. I would be very happy to host you here and to, you know, uh, uh, ask questions. Um, I would uh, let my everyone in the chat people know, feel free to um, send me messages. And if you have questions for Jody, I'll kind of weed through them Find, pick out some good questions so when we meet again we can um toss some questions at her i i did the best i could there are a lot of questions that i have you know i that's the problem with reading i love to read and the more you read it just generates more questions and uh so this has been a lot of fun jody so what are you up to these days that you've got the world anti-imperialist forum um or project or whatever it is WAP 21 before you leave tell people about that and where they can go to learn more sure well, um, you can follow the World Anti-Imperialist Platform. Uh, on Telegram, it's Platform News. Uh, on the internet, it's WAP, WAP21.org, and also WAPnews.org. Uh, you can follow me on Telegram, uh, just Jyoti Bra. You'll find my channel there. Uh, my party's website is here, thecommunist.org. It is the best Marxist analysis in the English language you're going to find, so you should definitely you know, make that a regular place. If you come to Telegram, 
it's my preferred social media people so if you look on telegram for the communists you will find our channel there and every day there's usually a, a new a new story put onto there uh, you can also find us on youtube proletarian tv uh, we're on twitter you'll find us cpgbml i think um yeah i think that's about it Oh, one, one, oh, you know, I did forget to ask you one thing, if you got it before five minutes to um, uh, uh, just explain for people who may not know what happened to your brother, Ranjit. Um, there are people who may not know that story, particularly here, because you know it's not going to be covered in the news. If you've got a cool. moment, I don't want to take up too much of your time. So, give me one second. I'll show you the picture. We have a pamphlet. I alluded to it earlier. This is it. It's called Zionism, a racist anti-Semitic and reactionary tool of imperialism, right? Uh, it's a, our party pamphlet. It was written by my father several years ago, and we always have it on our stalls. And of course, recently there have been uh, weekly demonstrations uh, in support of the people of Palestine. Um, very big demonstrations in Britain, not only because we have a large uh, Muslim population, we have a very large anti-war sentiment in our country, and we also have a growing understanding that Britain is complicit in the crimes in Israel, not just today, but historically. We have a historical responsibility for the creation of this problem. And we have been sponsors of it for 100 years, not just. And of course, today, every member of our uh, ruling elite uh, and the people who want to serve the ruling elite genuflects before Israel, swears to be a good Zionist, and to let us give the green light to anything the Zionists need to do to, to sustain their project, uh, no matter what that means for Palestine. So, you know, when we see even the uh, Labour Party leaders, you know, refusing to condemn the war crimes of Israel and green lighting whatever they do and, you know, weapons being sent left, right and centre, uh, very upsetting for the uh, huge number of British people. And that number is growing. So there have been a lot of demonstrations. And... Uh, and the flip side of this huge kind of mass movement in support of Palestine, we have this determination, which you've also seen in the USA, to try to portray pro-Palestine sentiment. Now, this has been going on for a decade, hasn't it, actually? To portray uh, pro-Palestine sentiment as anti-Semitism and to portray anti-Zionism as anti-Semitism. Of course, it's not that. There's nothing racist about being opposed to a racist supremacist state, right? Uh, it is the opposite. We're fighters against racism. But anyway, this narrative is being built and our police are clearly coming under a lot of pressure through the media, through our political class to help them to build this narrative that says it's a hate march and there's hate speech happening and there's actions of racial hatred being inspired by these events. Uh, in order to facilitate this, they basically came up to our party stall where this was on the stall with many other, you know, all of our, all of our literature was on the stall. Four of our comrades were stood under a gazebo, you know, by a table that had this as one of the things that was on the stall, um, uh, you know, open for people to buy if they want to. And the police were coming backwards and forwards. The police have known about this pamphlet since it was published, by the way. They've seen it many times. Uh, so clearly it wasn't a legal decision. This is a political decision. On one particular day, a couple of weeks ago, uh, my brother was one of four people who were stood uh, by the stall when the police came up once and, and kind of were having a look. Then they went away. Then they came back and said, oh, we have to confiscate the books. Then they went away. Then, went, then they came back and said, oh, no, actually... Uh, We've been told a crime has been committed <laughs> and they were arrested for incitement to racial hatred. They were held. They had also everything on the stall was confiscated. They were taken to a police station far away from the protest to make sure that there was no kind of solidarity activity anywhere nearby. Far, far away. Um, took them hours to get there. When they were there, they were held for 24 hours, although one of them was just a 16 year old boy. Do you think they could have let him go, to be perfectly honest with you? But anyway, they wanted to give him a scare as well. So they kept them in isolation for 24 hours um, before letting them go. They let them go on bail with the condition that they're not allowed to uh, hand out or sell literature in public. Uh, and they're not, allowed to, they're not allowed to deviate from the main route of marches, whatever that means. Um, and they're not allowed to carry swastikas. 
because we go around carrying swastikas. And basically what they're saying is because the design of this pamphlet uses a symbol, we didn't invent this symbol, somebody else invented it, but it's, it's, it's quite clever, right? Because it refers to historical facts of the um, collaboration between Zionists in the 1930s and the Nazis. And these are facts which are well-documented historically. And of course, the, the philosophical continuation of Nazi ideology through Zionist ideology, which is also, you know, they're directly linked in terms of their fascist supremacism, right? So this, this symbol means something to us. It's not just sticking a soft sticker on as a, as a, as a uh, um, kind of shock value. We see other elements on this um, cover, they back that up, right? So you can see here, you, see, you, you might not be able to see this. This is a picture of a T-shirt that was doing the rounds in the Israeli army. They call it their defense force, don't they? What a joke. Um, at the time, I think it's from 2008. You remember that horrific war in Gaza that we were, were so outraged and emotional back then? It's, an, it's a T-shirt that uh, members of the IDF were printing and, and selling to each other. And the picture is of a pregnant Palestinian woman with a target over her. And underneath it says, one shot, two kills. This, this is the ideology of the so-called defense force of Israel, right? And these are pictures they show, basically showing how the Israelis, you know, bring up their children to be soldiers and to hate Arabs. You know, they're signing bombs and they're learning to use huge weapons as toddlers. You know, I mean, these are just, this is Israeli life, right? This is the, the pattern of indoctrination. And this down here, that's an oil derrick, right? That's to remind you what all this is really all about. Yeah. So that's the... This is, now, you see, with, we're explaining to you how Zionism, Zionism itself is anti-Semitic by claiming to speak for all the Jews. They are creating anti-Semitism in the world. They're making people hate Jews when they should hate Zionism because they say Zionism is the same as Jewish people. They say, we don't say that, the Zionists say it. And they're doing a terrible disservice to Jews in the process, right? It's a lie, but they're creating anti-Semitism. Um, we say Zionism is racist, um, but we, are, we were accused of inciting racial hatred. Now, we don't know yet whether the police are going to actually try to take us to court. Uh, the four who were arrested have to report back to the police station at the end of February to find out. In the meantime, while they were arrested, the four of them had their houses raided at three in the morning uh, and devices uh, taken... Um, you know, literature taken, you know, their houses searched by policemen three in the morning. Again, it's it's really intimidation tactics, isn't it? Uh, it's, 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 you know, you would not expect on the basis of standing near a table of literature that you would get that kind of treatment from the police. Um, it's very, it's very much a political decision. It will be very interesting to me to see if they decide to bring a case, because of course, we would be very happy to argue a defense of the contents and the cover of this pamphlet in court. And I think the state would be absolute lunatic to take us to court over it. If they do take us to court, I would say it's a sign of their panic. Um, my hunch is that they won't give us that golden opportunity to bring attention to ourselves and our politics in that way. I think they're, I think they're not quite that stupid. Um, like I say, if they do do it, I think it will be a sign of, of panic in the system. Thank you very much, Jody Barr. So everyone, thecommunist.org, the um, and as uh, she gave all the information earlier, you can follow uh, follow them on uh, Telegram. And uh, Jody Barr, thank you very much. And I look forward to regular, you know, hopefully, as I said, if you're available, I'd love to do a weekly interview, if not bi-weekly, as your, um, as your schedule allows. You let me know. We'll be, we'll stay in touch and um, we'll figure this out. Um, our, get our, um, um, I'm, I was looking in the chat that people are really enjoying this conversation. And I see people on the other side, oh, I don't agree, whatever. That's good. A good productive conversation where people can disagree. And um, and and I think that's great. So we've got a lot of people on, in the chat that are agreeing and that are being motivated to, to, to think. So that's great. Thanks a lot, Jody Brar. And I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you. All right, everyone. I am heading out of here. So thank you very much. Don't forget, if they throw me off YouTube, Go to rockfin.com forward slash Garland Nixon because I will still be there amongst other places. I'm out.